I mean, things like the D-pad was something that was a huge innovation as well at yeah. Nintendo. What'd you call me? D-pad. Welcome to another backward compatible Thanksgiving special. This week, Jim, Doc, and Chris serve up a veritable feast of side segments. No turkey this time, kiddos. Including a heaping serving of button moshed potatoes, the gaming meta loaf, and of course, plenty of table talk. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 52 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, I'm here. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today is kind of our Thanksgiving special. Um, We had just a lot of different stuff we wanted to talk about today. And so rather than try to force in a meaty topic, we thought we would uh, have a a feast of topics. Merry Thanksgiving! Yeah, so (laughs) essentially what we're doing is um, we're having a Thanksgiving feast, but with just the sides. So we've got the dressing, mm. got the cranberry sauce, got the mashed taters, but we don't have any turkey. No Cause turkey. Because the turkey is the thing that takes all the time to make, if, right? If I know you guys, there'll be plenty of turkey. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be plenty. You're, you're good point. Yeah. Everything's gonna be very salty. <laughs> very, very. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to heavily salt. Get some, get some salt in here. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah, very cool. And lots of wine-ing. Oh, there we go. Nice. But we're, we're still we're still calling it the segment Chautauqua, right? Um, if you want to call it that, you may. Okay. I, I kind of prefer smorgasbord. Oh, the the smorgasbord, the, seg- the, the second segment smorgasbord, Chautauqua? smorgasbord, smorgasbord, smorgasbord. 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 What language are we speaking? In? I, have no I don't idea. know. I think it's the Swedish chef from <laughs> the Muppets. That's what well, I was going for. Well, I know it's always in English on our show. The button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I uh, just recently grabbed Super Mario Maker. Um, which is something I've been meaning to get for a little while now, but I haven't been able to afford it. And I'm start, finally starting to get paychecks, which I'm very excited about. What are those? Yeah, no, it's a, I'm, I'm still getting used to the concept, oh. actually. <laughs> um, but I've been able to uh, start messing around a little bit with Super Mario Maker. Not much. I've seen a lot more of it played than I've actually been able to play so far. Uh, but one of the first things that strikes you, it's really clever. Nintendo um, just understands fun, I think, in a way that's very intuitive to them. Because even the editor, it's it's a level editor, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so as game designers, we picture things like UE4 and Unity and stuff like that. Like all these sort of like very boring, this is a computer interface and you are making a level. and mm-hmm. oh, yeah. it, it can be fun, but it's you know very bland. Um, Mario Maker is practical. They, they, they turn their level editor into a game. And it's mm. amazing. Like they, they give you this little tutorial where you start off, you're playing as Mario, and then you find that you can't get past a certain point because someone didn't finish the level. And so they say, oh, why don't we help a fellow maker out and actually finish the level for them? And then they basically have just like little semi-transparent things like put a block here, um, put a block with a mushroom in it here, um, you know, make a structure here, that sort of thing. Um, so it's kind of like fill in the blank. And it's very intuitive. They're not telling you what each of the tools are. They're just letting you sort of see it, and you take those cues, and you build this level. Mm. Um, and like the, there's like this little remixed version of the stage music for whatever uh, game and stage you're in. Um, so like the, did, 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 did. Um, and then as you're drawing things, there's like this little computerized voice that's subtly sort of saying the name of the thing you're drawing on, but it changes um, pitch and it sort of like tries to time itself somewhat with the little remix. And so it sounds really goofy, but it's like this really fun, like little like you're drawing a shape like uh, like along with the music and stuff like that. So they've made this entertaining <laughs> wow. thing out of making a level. And it's amazing. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I've, I've actually looked at that and was thinking of... Um, so I've been thinking of getting a Wii U for a while now, and because mm-hmm. there's several games on it that I actually want to play. This is one that I thought was interesting. I wasn't sure you know, how much I might like it, but it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. And I've, I mean, you can basically download games mm-hmm. from anyone else. That's oh, and that, that's the great thing about it, too, is that it's not... Play through them, essentially? Really? Yes, yeah. You can play other people's levels. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's... Um, What's cool about the game is it's not just you get it so you can make your own levels. You can upload your levels and, of course, download others. So you can actually get Super Mario Maker just to play other people's levels. Even if you have no intention of playing your own, it's basically like an infinite Mario game. And if you're Super Massacore, which I know a lot of people are based on what you see on YouTube... Um, 
Oh, it's are, basically are they, the, or do they just make those so they can have people on YouTube play them? Well, there are people who for the reactions because that's what well, I think that, is going that, on. That too, but yeah. there's also the people who like you know clear these insane levels that aren't necessarily like the popular ones, mm-hmm. but they're just like the really hard challenge levels. And so if you've been wanting the Mario game where you've got this stuff, but you don't want to have to like download some fan made ROM or something like that, then it's kind of you know the ultimate game for you. Because um, I want to be the guy. You want to be the guy? I want to be the guy. <laughs> yeah, I think we all want to be the guy at some point. Nobody's going to get that. Yeah. <laughs> I think some people might. I think, I think people will get it. Um, it's the Gamer Podcast. That's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, d- so... Art would Chautauqua, you... that's what no one's going to get. Chautauqua. Yeah, Ar- yeah. Art Chautauqua, no one's going to get that. <laughs> um, so would you give it uh, uh, two, two Chris thumbs up? Two, uh, two Krugers up? So or, far, yeah, so I would far. say so. That's um, one too many Krugers. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's not here today, so... Oh, um, oh yeah, good point. But he's but he's played it probably. Yes, yes. So it's he fact, also, he's, he's actually spent more time than I have on it. He's so, actually made his own level so far. There you go. Four Krugers up. Yeah, four Krugers <laughs> up. Right. Oh my. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I definitely I think it's going to be a lot of fun to mess around with. And what I'm interested to get into is sometimes people sort of look at these levels and say this level has like a point zero two percent clear rate of all the people who play it. You know, only point zero two people have actually cleared it. Oh. Um, See, that's what I'm, I'm actually going to try to put my stuff out <laughs> yeah. there, and I'm going to consider a moderate to high win rate actually a good thing because I'm going to try to actually make levels like stretch on my level design skills because I'm good at high yeah. concept, but I want to practice like nitty gritty moment to moment level design, mm-hmm. and so I'm really excited from that. I would argue point that maybe like a sixty or seventy percent, or maybe even an eighty percent would mm-hmm. be a good one because if it's too high, mm-hmm. then, then it's, it's too, too easy. easy. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I agree, I agree with Doc, but it also kind of depends on the sort of level that you're making. Like if you're intending. Uh, oh, I want this level to be one of the early levels in, in this game that I mm, thought of, like right. the concept. You'd want people to beat mm. it. But if you're thinking, oh, this is going to be like the final boss level, like the Bowser's Castle level, mm-hmm. then you would want it to be more challenging and have a lower rate. But mm-hmm. I agree, the ones that, that are like 0.2% completion, yeah. that's literally just someone trying to make it a ridiculously hard... There's some people who make stages specifically to troll you. Right, yeah. so it's just... what's I mean, honestly, for me, like there's no real point to mm-hmm. playing through those. I think um, it's just silly but to... That- to at that point. Along the same, same lines of what you were just saying, though, Jim, uh, there is someone who, I haven't had a chance to actually try them out yet, but someone has basically made what they call Super Mario Maker World, mm-hmm. where they actually have a sequence of levels they've put together, and they basically lay it on this website so that you can you know punch in the code for each level and play it as if it was a full-length game. Um, it's not full-length. It's still relatively short compared to a full-length Mario game, but it's thought out in that sort of way, and the level design is meant to be... Um, thoughtful and creative and more like an actual Mario game. See, that's so. fantastic, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the sort of thing that I was hoping would happen with yeah. Super Mario Maker, that people really, as opposed to... So when I first heard it announced, I mm. assumed there was going to be a lot of people just trying to make ridiculously hard levels just yeah. to basically kind of troll people mm-hmm. or, to, or to go into that massacre mm-hmm. element, which I think is more focused on making YouTubers play it and then hearing their reaction when yeah. they die mm-hmm. yeah. than it is anything else, to be honest with you, which I have no interest in seeing. Sure. But I was ho- more hopeful for mm. things like that, where it's more more of a positive. Mm. I'm going to try to put together a bunch of levels that have some sort of like theme around them. Mm-hmm. That the idea is that you're actually playing through sort of a game, so you're mm-hmm. actually, you know, supposed to, in quotation marks, eventually beat it if you, you know, are skilled, as opposed and, to just I'm just going to troll you and try to make it absurdly difficult. Mm. So what do you mean whenever you say punch in the code? Because uh, there, there's a download code that you can. Uh, each level has a download code, so you can't string levels together and create. Not yet, and actually that's something I was about to mention, is that they have since release come out with new um, updates with Mm -hmm. new content. So for Mm -hmm. example, it didn't release with the ability to add mid-level checkpoints, but they have added that since. And so I'm kind of holding out hope for is that they're going to release an update where you can actually have like a playlist of levels Mm -hmm. where you can actually... Because they have this thing in the game called a uh, 10 Life Challenge, Mm -hmm. where they've got a bunch of levels that were made by the developers of the game, I assume. And you play through them in sequence, and it's meant to give you ideas for your own levels, and they do some kind of clever stuff. And you try to clear oh. them all with only 10 lives. And so... It sounds like the code's pretty much there, then. Yeah. Like, all, I think all they would have to do is it's figure out how to implement it in a way that's intuitive for people to find and interact with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm really holding out hope for that, because then I'd love to be able to make my own Mario game with a string of levels. Yeah, okay. And not just about, like, here's this one level that I made that's really creative, but here is the progression that I'm intending from one level to the next. Well, hey, if, if you do that, I, I can tell you that there we do have a website that you could actually post this stuff <laughs> yeah. on, and you could say, hey, here's the code for these levels, and play them in this sequence. Yeah. So, you know, let's use that resource. We've got it. For sure. Good point. And intuitive design is always something that we've done well, so... Mm-hmm. 
Um, okay, well, um, this week I've been playing through um, actually a couple of several different games. The one I'm going to talk about is um, Walking Dead Season 2, and it's something I'm not going to you know put out any spoilers, but it is a game that we are going to do a roundtable discussion on probably in um, you know another week or so. At which mm-hmm. point we will do spoilers. At which point we will do yeah. a lot of spoilers. So if you are interested in playing the game, it has, it has actually been out for a while, mm-hmm. but if you haven't played it yet, you don't want spoilers, please play it before we do our roundtable discussion. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about it. It is a Telltale game. Um, season one was something that we talked about a lot. I don't, we didn't actually do a roundtable discussion on it, but mm-hmm. we did. We have talked about it several times. Mm-hmm. And we did a roundtable on the on, podcast, um, The Wolf Among Us, Correct. which is really which, I, which I really liked. This mm-hmm. one I would not say is better than The Wolf Among Us. Oh, I, I still agree. think that's yeah. the best of the Telltale yeah. games so far that I have played. Um, however, Walking Dead season two was enjoyable. I liked the narrative, so I'll say if you like season one and you're interested in these uh, the Telltale adventure games, um, it's something that I think you'll enjoy. Um, I will say that there are definitely some uh, plot twists. I do think it has an issue where, because you're playing as um, Clementine, I didn't really feel as immersed in the game. I felt almost removed from it, because I felt like I still had that protective feeling that I had in the first Walking Dead for Clementine, but I was playing a character that also had that feeling. So I felt like I was Lee in the first game. But in this game, I feel like I'm me making a decision for Clementine so that she doesn't die. So it's a weird disconnect as opposed to feeling like you're actually in the story. It's more like you're sort of controlling an actor in the story. It's, it's and without different. going into too deep a discussion, because we're going to save that for the round table. Right, and you've played I, this too. Right? I have, yeah. Okay. I think they actually do a really good job of understanding that that was going to be the case for most players mm-hmm. and sort of easing you into this new state of mind through episode one. And then by the time you start episode two, I think, for me at least, I was kind of, okay, now I'm a Clem. Really? Yeah. I, I never got that all the way through the series. Mm. Never at all. And I, to be honest, I think a part of that, too, was I think the, the, the way they did the cinematography, they regularly would, um, and I have cinematography, but it's essentially that's what it is, sure. the way they present things. There were a lot of moments where, um, a lot. This, it felt like there were a lot less moments where you were in control of what you were doing. They had a lot of, like, shots where they would have, like, a, like a high-angle uh, camera view of, of like Clem walking through a forest or something like that. I did that in, I think episode like two or three or mm-hmm. something like that. Various things where they would have these little cutscene moments, and they did that a lot more often than the first the first season, from what I remember. You had less of these, oh, walk around and explore this area and talk to people and figure something out, and more, you know, cutscene things mm-hmm. happen, all these little, like little camera stuff. Okay, now you have your chance to do something. Okay, mm-hmm. back to another cutscene. So it felt a lot more mm-hmm. the pacing um, was segmented. Different. Yeah. And I think part of that, again, was because I think they were not expecting people to feel like they were Clementine. And I think, to be fair, I don't know if you really... It's, I think that's a very difficult thing to expect people that are playing this game who are almost all, and I would imagine all, going to be much older. Mm-hmm. And um, I, would still, I would still say, without any evidence, probably majority male, mm-hmm. just because that's where the you know gamers tend to lean. But uh, I'm not going to say for sure, but that's my assumption is that it's going to be mostly um, mostly guys. But even for the girls that are playing, you're still playing someone that is a little kid. Mm-hmm. So it's a very different mindset no matter what. Whereas with Lee, I could feel like, okay, you know, yes, I've never been to prison like he had, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm also an adult guy. So it feels mm-hmm. it's a little bit more you can of a, a connect more there. Yeah. This is going to be a good discussion. I'm looking forward I think to. so. No, no, no. I think I think so. And I, and I did enjoy it quite a bit. So I'm just I'm kind of being nitpicky. So I think it'll it'll be fun to have a round table and just kind of talk about it. And um, I honestly think it would made would have made a better um, comic or like short season of a t- television series than a game. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. there were a few um, moments though. <laughs> where the the choice that you have to make, like I. I not often Telltale Games, while I do like a lot of the choices they give you, um, there were a few times in particular where I was very torn between a choice. And, like, I felt bad after making a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, even if I didn't like the seat, like, and we'll get into this in more detail later, of course, but even if I didn't like the season in certain ways as much as I like some other Telltale series, there were a few moments in particular that were, like, really gut punch for me mm. in a good way. I felt, I definitely felt where, as the series went on, um, Especially towards the end, I found my choices getting a lot easier. Mm. Although there was a moment, I guess we'll have to talk. We'll talk about it later. That was really cool towards the very end. But my my last choice at the end, I will say, was kind of difficult in a way. Mm. But at the same time, I felt completely justified. And then at the very end, when you know everything, mm. uh, essentially when you're when you're when you go off at the end, you have that one final choice. I just felt like I don't know. I, 
I don't. I, I, I guess I'll say. I'll say I felt betrayed. I guess mm-hmm. I'll say that, and without game, I don't think that gives away too much. Okay. Um, okay, but uh, I don't want to talk too much about it before, without spoiling it. Yeah. So let's move on. Um, um, oh, uh, I should. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I gave this away. But uh, yeah, you're an alien all along. Sorry. <laughs> sorry to spoil it. Doc. Oh man. No. Uh, <laughs> it was all the dream. It was all the dream. Yeah. yeah at, at one point, at one point, um, you wake up and you realize there weren't ever any zombies. It was or, all a dream. No, you do. But you realize that season two was actually just a dream. There you go. And you wake up and Lee's still alive. There you go. Um, <laughs> is it is it Rick who wakes up and he's in bed at the hospital and he's like, Yeah, Carol, <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Carl. Carl. Carl, 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 Carl. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so yeah, you mentioned. Um, you, you mentioned a game I'm supposed to have been playing and, and haven't been, and you mentioned a building game, and that's because I've been playing my own building game uh, called Fallout. Mm. Um, is this, is this, I, I think is this Fall or Fallcraft? Yeah, Fallcraft, yeah. Mm. Um, now, now, is this Fallcraft 4? This, this would be... No, but no this, would, this, this would is be, the first Fallcraft. This is, this <laughs> is definitely Fallcraft, the first yeah. Fallcraft. Um, no, I, and I say that jokingly, be because uh, I know it's been getting some flack over that, but the truth is, um, this has very quickly risen to my uh, favorite game of all time ever. Wow. Really? Really. Um, and well, you're a huge Minecraft fan. Let's, let's, let's preface this with that. I am. Okay. And I was also looking forward to uh, Fortnite, which apparently has been infinitely shelved forever. Hmm. Um, I've never heard of Fortnite. Yeah, it was... Well, it, is that another building? Sort it, it, of game it's or? exactly what it is. Okay. Yeah, it was it was Minecraft, but with flat walls and stuff. Anyway, um, it was The Sims with zombies. Is really what it came down to. Um, I'm a huge Fallout fan. I've always been a huge Fallout fan. I remember back in college when the first Fallout came, and and a, and a buddy of mine um, named Ryan. He's like, "Hey, I found this new game. It's called Fallout. I think it'll probably run on your computer if you create a boot disk," <laughs> at which I had to do. And I and I loved it so much that I actually traded him my VHS copy of Austin Powers for it. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and so I think that was a pretty good trade. Actually. <laughs> but um, In but it was a transformative gaming experience for me. So yes, there's nostalgia glasses involved. Yes, I absolutely shed a tear whenever Sulik died in the second one. Yes, uh, the third one came hey, out. Spoilers. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I still haven't played the second one, jerk. Yeah, well, I think it was more my choice. The second, the second one, I will say, is, is, is still my favorite of the series. But uh, go ahead. Story-wise, yeah, I think it has, has a lot of strong points um, in world building and that sort of thing. Um, you know, whenever 3 came out and, and changed it to first person, it was a completely different experience and, and it sort of rebooted the, the the whole universe in my brain, if you will. And now there's this place that I can only go to when a new Fallout comes out. And it's... It's that zone where that night at the midnight release, I go home and I literally play for 18 hours straight. <laughs> and, and I go into this zombie mode myself. Excuse me. Um, I go into this uh, feral ghoul state myself. <laughs> and <laughs> No, they're not, yeah, they're not zombies. Yeah, that's they're right. Not they're zombies. not zombies. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's just, it, it changes my brain chemistry for a while. Um, and, and we're about two weeks out from the release at the time of recording this. And so it's like... Uh, I'm still in the zone here, and it's nothing else matters. No other games. I'm I'm there. I'm I'm totally in the Fallout world right now. Mm-hmm. I have uh, three suits of power armor, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, I know where the fourth one is, but I haven't gone to get him yet. So so let me ask you this. This is something that because has concerned me. I do plan on playing the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, mainly, it's what concerns me because one of the things I loved about the earlier Fallout games, and what something that I've loved about um, CRPGs in general, mm-hmm. are dialogue options yeah and i feel like this one is limiting itself because it only has the four options a lot of that probably because it has a very strong console mm-hmm. focus do you feel like you're limited or is this something that you don't you don't really care no much actually about? i think that it's solved the infinite shelf problem um well, i don't you know, think it had a, that problem oh it, it it i think three did oh three well three was in my opinion not good like i actually like i mean it was good in some ways but it didn't feel like fallout that's why i'm so hesitant sure. for whereas new vegas felt like Fallout to me. Well, this is a blending, a happy blending of some of the older things that are in Fallout with some of the things that were in 3. Mm-hmm. Because um, I wasn't the hugest fan of New Vegas. I just didn't enjoy that one as much. Really? Why, yeah. why not? I just... Because it was a lot closer to Fallout 2 than Fallout 3. It, it was, but it was it was too close to Fallout 2. It was like it was, it was posing and it was just trying trying too hard, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and I know Uncle Fergus was back on the team and everything, but it, it's just one of those deals where... For me, it just didn't didn't captivate me as much, hmm. um, and I, I don't know why. I can't really speak to exactly why. But you get to kill Chandler Bing. <laughs> I mean, does that not appeal to you? So what? Who cares? Oh. Um, 
I, I think a lot of it with, with these types of games, it has to do with the same reason why I like Assassin's Creed. I've been to a lot of those places. So whenever Assassin's Creed 2 was taking place in Italy, it, it was a place that I went to in college. It was a place that I'd been. I stood on top of the Duomo. I stood in, inside of the Pantheon, mm-hmm. things like that. And so there was an emotional impact for me. Um, it's the same with this. I've, I've been to Boston. Um, I had a chance to actually uh, go to Art Festocon and, mm-hmm. and, and be on a panel and, and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I hear they also have the Cheers bar in there. Yeah, from actually, what, I, they, what I've heard. They do. It's kind of interesting. Uh-huh. Um, is there is there a, a, a sort of a pudgy ghoul in there named Norm? Just kind <laughs> no, of sitting at a bar I don't know. They um, should do that. I mean, but, why not? But I did go to uh, I did go to Hubris Comics and, mm. and beat that part. And you can actually get Grognek's axe um, and his <laughs> outfit, his butt flap, basically, oh, and run cool. around the wasteland as Grognek, which is pretty exciting. Um, and it also starts the thread for um, being able to be a superhero in other ways too. Um, but. Um, <laughs> I think the thing that I love about Fallout, and especially where they've gone with it recently, is you can play the way you want to play. You can play the the type of character that you want to play. Um, but now they've also taken it in the narrative direction, too. With the companions, um, they, they will like you or not like you based on the actions that you're doing. Um, and everything is more immediate. And, and so whenever you say, and this is to answer your question, mm. um, instead of it being extremely gla- uh, granular and extremely obvious um, that I'm taking a Paragon option here, I'm doing this, instead you've got this, this sarcastic option. Um, and, and for me, because I'm playing on PS4, if I hit the square button, it's, it's the sarcastic option. And some people will look at you and be like, you, you being a smart aleck? <laughs> what? And it just starts combat. Right. Yeah. Others, they'll look at you and they'll go, ha, kid, I knew I was going to like you. And so instead of it being about uh, creating the character that you um, are trying to create in order to game it, basically you're, this, there's a lot more role play, sort of intuitive role play, if you will. You have to know how to From situation to, to situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's this, this one great moment where you've got the superhero outfit on, you're doing all of this. And um, his name is the, the Silver, Silver Shroud. He's mm-hmm. called the Silver Shroud. Um, and, and one of the dialogue options then becomes, speak as Shroud. <laughs> and so instead of, um, listen, I don't like the things you're doing. Why don't you back off, buddy? Uh, it's, evildoer! <laughs> I'm here to vengeance against all of the wrong in the mm-hmm. wasteland. And some of them will look at you and they're like, you are a freak. And just, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's great. Uh, so I honestly think, I don't think you need more than four options, and I get, I get the theory or the philosophy of having that. I really do. Because well, the, the theory behind it would be that if I'm talking to you, I have tons of options. Of you have infinite say. options, and I and I'm not well. I'm not necessarily saying that you should have infinite options, but mm-hmm. I, I never really felt like I had too many options in yeah. like Fallout or Planescape Torment or Baldur's Gate, all these games that had multiple. Well, Planescape is a great example because Planescape can have a yes. A no, a yes lie, yeah. and a no, no lie. Planescape, Planescape has done it better than any other but, uh, so far, in my opinion. But if that's what you're looking for as better, then yes, you're not going to find that in Fallout. But I don't think you're going to find it in any of the Fallouts. No, I think 2 did a, did a pretty damn good job. And I think New Vegas did a better job than the other Fallout games. So far, at least, in terms of like the Bethesda Fallout mm-hmm. games. Well, and It's the ones that I've played. I think the thing that... I guess the thing that, that, that bothers me is more... Um, I, I guess it's just more, it feels like, you know, they're limiting these choices not so much from a design decision, but mm-hmm. because, A, we want to make sure that we can voice act things, so we want to make sure that there's a certain number that we can, you know, because it's much easier to write, I'm not, it's not, it's never easy, but it's easier from a production value, you know, production standpoint to write more choices if you just are writing the dialogue as opposed to have paying someone to come in and speak all of it. Yeah, but that's an oversimplification because whenever you're looking at a lot of these so-called branching dialogue trees in the earlier fallouts included, what you really have is a bottleneck mo- uh, model where the, the outcome is either going to be positive or negative. In the first fallout and fallout two, you, your dialogue options were many, but in the end of the conversation, when the conversation ended, Either MacGyver, Killian, was going to lower his head because he doesn't like you, or he's going to raise his head and smile because now he likes you more. True. But and how that you, was it. But how you get there is more up to you, as opposed to you only have a couple of But options. it's an illusion, and that's my point. True. And I it's interesting that, by the way, it's, I think it's very interesting that you're on this side of the argument for this game, but then when we talk about the Telltale games, <laughs> our sides are switched. That's exactly right. Because <laughs> very interesting. why do I play Fallout? 
it's not for the streams and streams and streams of dialogue options. It's so that I can enter into VATS and blow the heads off of uh, super mutants while uh, creating a character who's really good at computers. I'm intrigued though by what you were saying, and I want to. I want to do. I do also want to play this myself at some point. Maybe we can even make mm-hmm. it a future roundtable once we all get a hold of it. Yeah. Um, but I'm intrigued by what you're saying about having to kind of react to the person you're talking to and yes. having basically a consistent toolkit in yeah. each conversation. It's less about your character building your character as a consistent character than it is about playing the character as you want to play. Uh, the character in the context of the situation. Hmm. Because the truth is, there's a lot of stuff that's hard-coded into this. You are married. You are a father. So at the very beginning, what this is saying is that you are coming from a traditional 1950s-style family. Hmm. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that your son, Sean, is kidnapped. Um, Now, you can play Hmm. as the mother or you can play as the father. And whichever... And implicitly, the other one's dead. Well, I wasn't going to go that far, but now that you said it, yeah, that's absolutely right. Within the first few moments of the game, the other one is murdered in cold blood and your son is stolen. And it's a kidnapping story, which is fantastic because three was the exact opposite. You go out into the wasteland to find Liam Neeson, your father. Mm-hmm. Is is the overall story any... I've heard that the overall story is actually not good. And it's mostly the, uh, the smaller quests that are interesting. Is that true? Is that a true statement? Because well, what I've heard. Here's the problem. And I'll ask you, and, and before you give me your answer, uh-huh. what did you think of the story in Fallout 3, the main story, because I hated it. A lot of people hated it, but there were aspects of it that I really liked. Mm. Uh, the big finale I thought was fantastic with the giant really? robot. Oh, yeah. I thought that was... Wait, no, the giant... Oh, oh, that part. I, I thought, yeah. I'm thinking of the very last part where you have that, like, sacrifice yourself moment. I felt that whole thing well, was very Well, that one was really good and really powerful until the DLC, and when it was like, oh, yeah, um, so whatever choice you made, it, did you kill your partner? You killed your partner? Oh, I'm really sorry, because... It turns out that if you'd just done it yourself, you wouldn't actually be dead. Yeah. And that, so that was kind of a, a retcon cheese out. But um, no, and, and, and to, to get to the question that, that you're asking here, um, I think that the there's no, no winning for losing in this kind of a situation. If you make it all about the main story, um, then the side quests feel like side quests. If you make the, the main story as... Uh, let's call it a little bit hazy, um, then you have side quests that become meaningful again. I'm in a moment right now where my my so-called main quest, I have three options. Three places I can go, three clue trails to follow. I can do it in the order I want, and I I have no idea which Mm. one is going to be the one that's going to pay off with finding the next trail and clue for my son. But I can tell you that um, I've hunted down a detective who's helping me, and this is everybody does this, but Mm. his name is uh, Valentine, Nick Valentine. And he's a synth, which means he's an artificial human. And that was, I'm sorry, that, that is a spoiler. but um, Because the trailers, it seems like synths are kind of like almost the bad guys. an antagonistic force. Right. Or are they, right? Because mm. there's, there's some Freedom Trail stuff and there's some Underground Railroad stuff. So, I mean, but really, just like classic Fallout stuff, you really come down on, are the, are the Brotherhood good or are they bad? Um, you know, is, the, so, is the railroad good or is the railroad bad? So they have more moral grades than this one. Oh, Fallout Three, yeah. Fallout Three was pretty clear on who's good and bad. It was extremely no, biased. This one's extremely, which I hated. Um, and what's interesting is my my favorite Fallout has always been uh, Fallout Tactics: Brotherhood of Steel. Um, yeah, that was not really the top good one down well. one, but it's the mm-hmm. it's the turn the real time turn based was the new mechanic that they entered into it, um, and that's always been my favorite. But it's considered non canonical. Which is interesting because mm. there's a break off Brotherhood of Steel, which gets in its airships, goes all the way east, and then tries to progress back. Um, you know, and, and what, or it gets the other way around, goes all the way west, and then tries to progress back, progress, progress back east to Vault. I think it was one, mm. uh, Vault Zero, something like that, mm-hmm. um, which is the, the military thing with the, all the origins of the tech, and that's considered non canonical, but. Uh, if you consider that there are two Brotherhood of Steel groups out there, main factions out there, with a Pope and an anti-Pope, if you will, um, then it actually makes sense that this Brotherhood of Steel might be morally gray. Mm. They may be ambiguous. Biggest clue of all to it is that there's a line in that one that says, um, oh, and ladies, welcome to the Brotherhood of Steel. And it's a mm. big deal that there's women in the Brotherhood, but they had to do that because you are Brotherhood and you're a woman possibly in this mm-hmm. right. Well, I know I know in the in the but original before, two Fallout games, women. they were. Yeah, in the original two Fallout games, the Brotherhood of Steel was always in this sort of morally gray. Yeah, but it was also always men. And, True. And so in 4, 
um, the Brotherhood shows up at a really important part. Uh, again, this is another spoiler, but you emerge from um, a rooftop. And it was a little funny. I felt like I was being gated just slightly in the fact that I couldn't exit the way I came in, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know how they do that. They unlock a new door and then you're there. So I just pop out onto the roof and as soon as I do, I hear brum, 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 brum. I look up because mm -hmm. the sound is brilliant in this. I know where I'm supposed to look. Mm -hmm. And I hear over this loudspeaker, citizens of the Commonwealth, this is the Brotherhood of Steel. Uh, do not panic. We are here for... And it's just like, you look at this massive airship and then all these verdi birds and you're just like... Gosh, they're being <laughs> invaded. And I feel like I should get my rocket ship out and start you know, shooting at the thing, but I'm terrified to do it. And I just stand there like a dummy <laughs> for almost 10 minutes as this thing goes from one side to the other side of the map. And then I get new mission, investigate the airship. Hmm. And it's just, this is the way, as soon as I get to a point where I think I'm almost kind of getting samey, they throw this massive new thing at me hmm. and, and switch it up. Um, I'm loving it, but it is still completely open world. It's completely free. Um, I feel like I have freedom unlike any other. You know how with Fallout, you always get your um, your armor kind of in simple upgrades. You start out with leathers, and then you get uh, combat, and then you go on up. Mm -hmm. Finally, whenever you know you've made it, when you get your Brotherhood of Steel combat armor or mm -hmm. your um, power, power armor, your yeah. power armor. Well, in this one, you have your power armor within the first hour. But then you have to decide whether or not you're going to use it. Because there's this brilliant mechanic which allows you to switch out the pieces of the power armor individually, but also it requires a power core in order to run. So if you run around the wasteland picking up tin cans, uh, like we all do, you know, picking up picking flowers and picking up tin cans, you're gonna run out of power core. And you're gonna have you're gonna have to abandon your suit out in the wasteland and just stand there, wait for you until you get back <laughs> with a new power core. Or you can let the thing sit in the shop for a couple of days. And, you know, protect it in, in your community and mm -hmm. then uh, go collect power cores and come back. And when you get to a hard boss that's, you know, kicking your butt, you show up with your power armor and he'll give you the old crap look. Nice. Cool. Well, I think it's, it's we can suffice it to say that you're enjoying the game. So. <laughs> oh, no, <I> Absolutely. <laughs> this Week in Gaming History. Recording this on uh, November twenty second, so we have a couple of uh, uh, you know back to back on both sides of us uh, important moments. Um, yesterday on this on yesterday in nineteen ninety, that's November twenty first. Uh, that was when Super Mario World released in Japan, and that was the introduction of Yoshi. Yoshi. <laughs> yeah, we've had Yo we have Yoshi visiting us today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. That good was, job. That wasn't very good, actually. No. I, I retract that Yoshi. I like that Yoshi. That was a good Yoshi. Uh, yeah, actually, the, 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 the story behind Yoshi is, is um, one of those things where uh, Miyamoto had actually wanted to have Yoshi as part of the series for a while, but they weren't able to implement it on uh, the Famicom. I didn't know that. So, yeah, it was, I believe it was planned specifically for Super Mario Bros. 3, if I remember right. But I know he had it in like a bunch of old documents and plans, and he'd, he'd wanted to do this character for a while, this, like, um, you know writable character that Mario can ride around on that has its, like, the little... Plumber on a dinosaur, you can't yeah. go wrong. So well, it's wasn't Yoshi's debut, like, in a NES puzzle game also? Um, there was Yoshi that was just called Yoshi, yeah. but no, that wasn't... That, wasn't, that, that was, was later. later. That was later. Mm. Okay. Um, because they were still releasing um, games for the NES and for the Famicom after the oh, Super Nintendo had already come out. Yeah. Okay. Or the Super Famicom. Oh, I remember the Super Nintendo. I remember when I got one mm -hmm. and um, I plugged in Super Mario for the first time. It was, it was amazing. It was a really cool mechanic to add to the game. Mm -hmm. That was something that people really didn't expect because um, you know you had you had the original Super Mario Brothers, which obviously was groundbreaking. And Super Mario Two was just a totally different game, and then mm -hmm. Super Mario Three was pretty much the the original Super Mario Brothers, and then they just sort of expanded on a lot of those With concepts, flying. right? And yeah. then they added mm -hmm. some extra stuff like the. Um, you know, the, the raccoon suit and all these different, like, Mario upgrades right. in that one. Like, the frog suit, frog the raccoon suit. suit. Um, and then when you get Super Mario World, it added, you know, other power-ups, too, like the flying mm -hmm. feather with the cape and all that. Mm -hmm. But it also had Yoshi, which was just this, like, totally cool extra thing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> just, like, point at me and I'll, like, I'll there you go. go. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I thought it was really cool. Um, I, and Yoshi's been a character that has been that has stuck around for, for years and has his own games, like Chris was saying, mm -hmm. has a uh, puzzle game. I played that one, by the way. 
on Game Boy for a long mm-hmm. time. They, they also had a Game Boy version of Yoshi. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's uh, Yoshi's Island and um, mm-hmm. Yoshi's Story and all that. So. Yeah, there's a new one coming for Wii U, uh, Yoshi's Woolly Big Yarn Yarn or Woolly Yarn or something like that. Uh, I think a Big Yarn might be it, big actually. Yarn. Okay. Or Woolly World. I Woolly think World. There we go. Yoshi's yeah. Woolly World. Or Woolly. Woolly World. I believe it's a. It's another. Um, yeah, Yoshi's Tongue Twister. It's similar to the. Ah, actually. Is Yoshi's Tongue Twister. <laughs> that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that actually. does make a lot of sense. Uh, wow. The trademark Yoshi Tongue. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Little known fact: Yoshi's Island was actually just Jurassic Park. There we go. They are dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. <laughs> and there are there are a lot of Yoshis. Is Yoshi the name of the species or the character? I think it's the species. Okay. So Wait, this is. is so this, you mean when Yoshi died? Oh. <laughs> yeah, how many Yoshis have have you personally killed? Yeah. <laughs> this just blended with the tar. It's like you you find a Yoshi egg, you hatch the Yoshi egg, and then you, you, you basically you force stuff its it, face until it prematurely grows into adulthood. Yes, and you force it to be your your you know essentially your mouth, and then you just kill it. Like you 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 do a jump, you use it to like you know bounce off and clear over a long distance, so then it just falls it to falls its doom. It falls down a pit, yeah. And then you just find another one. You're like, oh well, I'll just get I'm a gonna, Yoshi. I'm going to go with multiple quantum realities <laughs> so that it is in fact the same Yoshi. Okay. You just, just so I don't hibernate into in an egg until you're ready for it. Yeah, just so I can live, you know, with myself and sleep at night. <laughs> and then the, the the black sheep of the family is uh, Birdo. You know, that's this kind of a strange uh, Yoshi that uh, spits at no. Is Birdo a Yoshi? I don't no, think I don't, so. No. Okay. Just looks similar. Looks, there, there is looks a, like a Yoshi. There, there is Boshi, though, the blue Yoshi that's, uh, I think, a villain character, actually, in Super Mario RPG. It might have made an appearance in um, Yoshi's Island. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I've actually not played Super Mario RPG. Uh, the other big release is, uh, actually was released in November 23rd, this is the North American release, uh, in 1998, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. For the N64, and this was a very uh, influential game, very important, because uh, Nintendo was experimenting with 3D and 3D games, yeah. and sort of with, with Super Mario um, 64, they were able to sort of show, okay, here's how you can do a platformer in 3D, and they did, they did a lot of things that were copied by other um, developers, mm-hmm. because no one could figure out quite how to get 3D to work quite right with the actual 3D world. Um, until Nintendo came along. Then with Ocarina of Time, they introduced uh, Z-Targeting, which was something that mm-hmm. um, they had not done because was, this was a 3D action game. Yeah. And it's something that's been copied by pretty much, I mean, just about every game of that style, like a 3D action mm-hmm. um, type game uses Z-Targeting or well, something was, similar. That was about redesigning the controller, wasn't it? I mean, when they did the 64, yeah. they, they came at that controller from the idea of, okay, we're going to want to do 3D stuff. Yeah. So how what are we missing and mm-hmm. yeah. and I think sometimes the N sixty four controller gets a bad rap from people that didn't play it when it came out and maybe haven't handled it because it's it actually has a great design mm-hmm. and it gives you two different st- ways to hold it depending on the game yeah. you're playing. And the cool thing is that some games, for example, like Mario Kart, you can play the all of Mario Kart one handed. And what they really need to be playing in order to appreciate it is the classic NES and then. Super NES controller. Mm-hmm. Well, once you've played with that and you know mm-hmm. rub, I, rubbed a blister on your finger, I still have the callus. Yeah, <laughs> and and to be fair, I do think those were those were great controllers for their time. Oh, absolutely. But of, but of course, of course, controller design has improved over time. That's obviously. my point. But I mean, things like the D pad was something that was a huge innovation as well at yeah. Nintendo. Would you call me? D pad. <laughs> I'll do a D pad now. Uh, but yeah, the D pad was a, was a big innovation as well. But with with the N sixty four, they yeah. had that the analog the analog stick on That's there, right. which unfortunately ended up being relatively fragile, um, but worked really well for all of their three D games. You got mutant thumbs, dude. You were breaking those things. Well, I actually never had that problem. Me either. Not but I have I have heard a lot of people complain in terms of them. You need to stop listening breaking, to people. So the people are wrong. Well, I just I I. I, I just recognize that my opinion is just my opinion, so I kind of <laughs> want to see what other people are. And, I, and apparently, a lot of people had problems with uh, that thing either breaking or getting stuck. My guess is they ate a lot of Cheetos as they were playing and got yeah. some of that cheese dust in there. I didn't yeah. do that. I would never do that. I would never touch controllers unless I had clean hands. Yeah, yeah. Just I was remember, very meticulous. People about that. who don't have problems usually don't get on the internet and post about it. Hey guys, just wanted to let you know yeah, I had a great right, day right. today. My controller didn't break, and I'm yeah. really enjoying this game. <laughs> it's kind of like with the, uh, the 3DS <laughs> Smash Bros. came out. Everyone's complaining the the thumb pad keep coming keep kept coming off um, oh, really? and I never had that problem and so it's like I wonder just what percentage of people playing Smash Bros. 3DS you know, actually I, had the problem. I will say that my thumb, the, the N64 thumbstick really does get quite a workout um, and actually did become kind of loose 
from a lot of Super Smash Brothers play. Because mm-hmm. if you play, and I played, I played the hell out of the original Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it really would after a while. Mm-hmm. It would become a lot looser, and I think for a while it was actually kind of a benefit because you could spin it around a lot and like mm-hmm. kind of you know really have a lot more freedom. But at the same time, you, it's, I started to get worried. It never actually broke, but I started to get worried <laughs> that it was going to oh, at a certain funny. point. Um, but yeah, but getting back to Ocarina of Time um, and sort of what it did for the series, it really did. Of course, it introduced a new generation to Legend of Zelda, mm-hmm. um, but also it, it it came up came up with essentially the template for all of the three D Zeldas. Um, to follow in terms of the, the presentation yeah, of the game yeah, and, and the yeah. controls. Um, I do think this is another one of those games that I think is a little overrated. I, I don't think it's the best 3D Zelda. I think it'd be kind of sad if it was because, mm-hmm. you know, it's been several years. It's 1998 when this came out. Mm-hmm. So to say mm-hmm. that Nintendo never was able to top it, I think mm-hmm. is kind I of think, a disservice. I think for me it's like some of the fondest memories. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're looking at the game from an objective perspective, like, you know, I go, I went and played, you know, Twilight Princess at one point and then yeah. returned to Ocarina of Time. And while I still enjoyed Ocarina of Time, it definitely ages. Yeah, well, the combat in mm-hmm. Twilight Princess, to use that as an example, is so much better. Mm-hmm. And it, one of the reasons for that is in Ocarina of Time, when you're surrounded by enemies, they'll surround you in a circle and they'll stand there and they'll just kind of, kind of go back and forth, like move their hands up mm-hmm. and down. And not really, and then like one will step forward and attack you, mm-hmm. and then they'll back off. And then yeah. another one will step forward and attack you, and then it'll back so off. Just like Assassin's Creed. Yeah, so it's <laughs> it's really obnoxious. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, but um, but in uh, Twilight Princess, they actually do a really good job of having enemies um, have a lot more strategy. Like one will attack you from front, the other one will try to get behind you and attack you from behind. And they actually have like pretty good AI for trying to mm-hmm. figure out they'll come at you, they'll all attack you, and just they'll like all come at you. Order. Yeah, and they'll do some cool stuff, and and it's something that, and I understand there were limitations on the N sixty four, and they were uh, there's reasons why they did it that way. It's, I'm, I'm they, sure they didn't they probably, intend to do it they, that. Well, way. they probably tried it and found the playtesters were too frustrated with not being able to see people coming at them, so well, they and, stuck to um, yes, just like having one at a time. I, I still think it was in part a processing issue as well, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. And like the AI, they probably weren't able to mm-hmm. quite get it to work, so it, it turned into just the enemies like charging at you mindlessly and attacking because mm-hmm. that's pretty much what Zelda enemies did up until I think pretty much Twilight Princess and somewhat in Wind Waker mm-hmm. um, Twilight Princess I think is kind of underrated for that reason I do think the combat mechanics were pretty pretty sweet mm-hmm. but regardless Ocarina of Time I do think was a, was a really good game and it, it sort of um, came up with a lot of the ideas for the, the concepts for some of the different dungeons mm-hmm. and repeating those ideas in a lot of other Zelda games now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Alright, so I had a chance to play The Witcher. Um, not the video game, mm-hmm. mind you, the board game. There's a couple of neat things about this game. Um, are, you, are you a fan of the, the video games? I haven't played any of them, really. Yeah, so... I think, I think they're pretty cool. They're I, making a movie, by the way. Yeah, I heard this. Mm-hmm. Um, well, th- and this is an important factor, okay? I, I liked the game. I did love the game. But I think that anyone who is a fan of the series should definitely pick it up, play it, and will enjoy it. There's a, there's a modifier, if you will, by the fact that the four main characters that you play are characters from the series. Mm. Um, they're very, very much reflective of the personalities of the characters of the series. Um, and and I, I can't even really tell you the uh, like the names and stuff, but I played the red-headed mage... Uh, magic user, and it changed everything that I was doing. Nobody else in, uh, who was playing was doing what I was doing with magic. Hmm. Um, but there's some neat things about it. For example, the monsters that come out are all pretty tough. There's no uh, little tiny monsters. You're not killing pigs or anything like that, which I assume is kind of an echo of the, the game and the way that works, that you're yeah. after big monsters. Oh, yeah. Um, and the monsters stick around in regions. And there's about five or six different regions on the board, and it is a a board game in that sense. But you travel around, and you're trying to pick up little clue tokens. And whenever you get enough clues about the the mystery that you're trying to solve or the the thing that you're trying to do... One of my missions was to recover a lost relic from some bandits. Mm -hmm. And I never fought a bandit, not one. But that wasn't the point. Uh, What I actually did was I was trying to track down who it was that was doing it. So I was going from town to town, city to city, and I had to get the blue tokens. And there's blue tokens and red tokens and purple tokens. But by getting enough red tokens and enough blue tokens... I was able to, to trade those in then for solutions. And I had one blue solution and one red solution, and I trade those in. Now, red meant combat, and blue meant magic, and the purple was like uh, like social. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and what it really all came down to was I... Uh, it was a hard mission for me because I'm not a combat-heavy character. Mm-hmm. 
And so doing that was a little more difficult, but I got 16 points. And because I was drawing from the blue deck, which is her affinity deck, the fact that there was a red thing on it, it all balanced out. So it was really brilliant the way that it was done. Um, the neat thing about it, though, is just like, as I understand, with the game, it hurts you. It, it, it really punishes you, and it is beating you down. Because every time you do uh, something in an area, you then have to look, is there a monster associated with this area? If so, I'm either going to have to take uh, a negative consequence or fight the monster. And I might not be able to fight the monster, especially if I haven't developed my magic and if I haven't readied my, my spells and done these other things. And so every now and then I would just be taking the negative thing and I'd draw a card from that deck. Well, then it... I mean, sometimes it's like uh, you, you take a hit and sometimes it's uh, bad stuff happens to you and sometimes it's just, you lose your clues and that kind of a thing. But what it really felt like was two steps forward, one step back. So if that's a mechanic that uh, people wouldn't like, then it's not for you. But as I understand it, it's a pretty accurate depiction it, of I was going to say, Witcher. yeah, it sounds very similar to the games, the way that they are. And, and one of the things I really like about the open world because Witcher 3 especially, is it's, it's totally open world, the mm -hmm. way that the game is set up. And one of the things I like about it so much is that the world is very, it's a very dangerous place and a mysterious place. Mm -hmm. And you can't just, you see a monster, you can't go, I'm going to go find this monster and kill it. No, you have to figure out how to kill it. You have right. to figure this out. And so you can't just, unless you understand how to take on this monster, mm -hmm. you're, one, you may not even be able to find it. Because, you know, they have their own little, like, you know, hunting grounds or like con like little concepts some of them only come out at a certain time of day that sure. kind of thing but also you need to know how to kill it if you don't know how to kill it and you just run into it and try to like hit it with your sword you don't have a strategy you're probably going to lose mm -hmm. uh but yeah it's so that sounds a lot like a um a pretty good adaptation of the video game which is or the video games i should say now what's your uh, objective in the game well, the objective is to have the most victory points okay. after three. someone finishes three missions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean you have to finish three missions. Mm -hmm. If you finish two really good ones and you have more points, that kind of a thing. Um, but something that you said um, brings me down to the mechanic of it, mm -hmm. which is uh, dice. Now, I had one die that was mine. It was the blue die. And the main character, what's the name of the witcher himself? Uh, Gerald. Yeah. yeah. He, he's Gerald. one of the characters you can play. Well, he gets five red dice. Hmm. And then everybody, every time they roll, they get five or three white dice. But those three white dice are not all the same. And are, there's, these all, are these six-sided dice? Yeah, they're, they're D6s. Okay. Um, but the cool thing about it is, like for the set of three mm -hmm. dice, there's one die that has one sword, a blank, and the rest are shields. Uh, there's one that has two swords, a blank, and the rest are shields. And then this one has three swords, and so on and so forth. Uh, I may have gotten that slightly off. There may be one more sword in each one. But the point is this. All the dice are truly unique. And so whenever you're rolling them, you you have to understand your own personal probability in actually getting a sword. As a magic user, my chances of getting a sword were very, very low. But my chances of getting a... Uh, a, a magical success were very high. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going up against a creature that, you know, if, in, if you don't get three swords, you fail. Um, or if you don't get three shields, you fail. And there's different fail and success conditions. So I might get mortally wounded but still kill it. Or I might... Hmm take no damage at all, but do none to him. There's, there's lots of possibilities for each monster. That seems really interesting. I, I've it's not heard of a system cool. that, that does that before. Is, does that seem pretty unique to you? I know you play a lot more yeah, board games than no, I Yeah, it, it no, was, it was unlike anything I'd ever played before. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot more intricacies and, and fun to it. There's a, a, a progression track and other stuff um, that I really liked. The, the dwarf was fun because he had companions. So by the time of it, at the, the end of it, he had like uh, eight dwarves in a pack <laughs> just following him around and, and just everything. And so I had a, I had a magical power, which mm. allowed me to recharge another magical power. And so by the time I was doing a refresh action, um, I could actually put two refresh tokens instead of one refresh token. It was a double for me. And so basically I had the ability to just ignore monsters and bad stuff. And so I was going wherever I wanted and then just throwing a token off, spending my extra action to refresh that and I'd double it up and I'd be fine. So I could go anywhere and do anything I wanted and suddenly it became a political game for me and not a fighting game. Nice. That's cool. So it kind of gives you options for the way that, that you want to play. Yeah. Yeah. That is really cool. But you have like to spend that. the time developing your character right. in the beginning right. to do it. Yeah. Got to play this sometime. So, uh, Doc, who is the publisher for The Witcher board game? Fantasy Flight. 
which okay. is one of my absolute favorite board game developers. Yeah, that makes sense with the custom dice you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do. They do love their custom dice, but they usually do a pretty interesting job. Um, yeah. Coming up with some unique ideas for it's the true. way they use dice. Well, it's so. funny because if you learn the vocabulary of Fantasy Flight, you mm-hmm. can actually spot some of their core signature mechanics in other mm-hmm. games. Um, probably my favorite is Twilight Imperium. I play it every year for my birthday. <laughs> and that one has so many mechanics from so many different games. Mm-hmm. Very cool. cool. Uh, Chris, did you want to talk a little bit about um, Epic PvP? Yep, so Epic PvP Fantasy is actually the full title, and it was a game that was on Kickstarter around the time that uh, we were doing genre. Hmm. Um, That might become a common theme when I'm talking about board games I'm playing lately, is games I ordered on Kickstarter. Um, (laughs) But this one I got in the mail the other day, and I actually... um, played around with my brothers to test it out. Uh, really interesting concept. What they do is it's uh, ideally kind of like a one-on-one game. It can also be a three-player free-for-all or a two-on-two. But each person has a character, and it's based on different fantasy archetypes. And so what you do is you have a um, uh, selection of race decks, and you have a selection of class decks. And what you do is you pick your race, you pick your class, you shuffle those two decks together, and each deck kind of has its own playstyle built into it. Mm. Um, and then you shuffle them up, and then um, it's actually a very elegant design. I really like the way they approached it, um, where it's very simple, it's not too complex, very straightforward. Basically, at the beginning of your turn, you draw two cards and you put it in front of you, and that's your aggression. Um, oh, also worth mentioning that your hit points are actually based on um, a number of life points that you have based on your race, and you actually draw those from your deck and just lay them face down, and those are your hit points. So even if you know the decks really well, you don't know which cards are you losing to, say, your life, for example. So that's uh, another randomizer they put into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you draw two cards, put them in your aggression. Your aggression is basically your um, currency to play cards with. Um, Each card has a cost, and you can play up to as much aggression as you have. Um, But if you want to draw cards that to your hand, you have to draw them from aggression. Um, you have to announce ahead of time how many cards you want to draw, so you can't just like cheese it and be like, uh, okay, I got the card I wanted, I'm stopping. You have to say, I'm drawing four from aggression and add them to your hand. Um, and then basically what you do is you play down um, cards that you... They start off as defense, and then at the end of your turn, you flip them over and they become attack. And sometimes cards will have different defense and attack values. The other player then on their turn has to put down a card that has at least an equal or greater defense value to your attack. Um, and if they do, that attack gets negated, it goes away, uh, no damage is dealt. Uh, but if the opposing player can't block all of your attacks, each attack that gets through deals one life damage. Um, and so you've got like, you know, four health, five health, that sort of thing. And uh, basically the objective of the game is to drain the other person's health before uh, they drain yours. So it's a very straightforward game. I get the impression that it can be very fast paced. Um, you know, you probably play like best two out of three or something before switching decks. Um... But uh, interesting game. I'm really interested to uh, play more of it and learn more of the strategy because when my brother and I were playing, we were both kind of trying to grasp some of the concepts, and he wasn't too into it. Um, it comes across as a little bit luck based because you kind of need to have the right cards in your hand to you know do stuff the way you want them want to. But there's also a strategy to making sure you have enough aggression to keep up with your opponent. Um, knowing when to draw to have more options, that sort of thing. So I'm, uh, I'm very curious to see how um, repeated play might pan out with this game. That drain health mechanic is so fundamental. So many games like that. I mm-hmm. mean, you think about even games like Magic, mm-hmm. um, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Those are all the same game, right? Kind of. Those three? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Different kids. <laughs> yeah. That, that was my point. <laughs> Magic the Gathering, I don't think, is... For kids. Oh, it's not? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> In the sense that uh, kids can't afford it. Oh, okay. Which is perplexing when you see like 12-year-olds at tournaments. Uh, that's and, a, and yes, I am being sarcastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not a magic player. <laughs> yeah, no, neither am I. Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting game. And I'm curious, too, to try a bunch of different combos. It's kind of like Smash Up in that regard, where you make a deck out of two different decks. Now that I like. Um, and so, like, you know, for instance, I played as a uh, Goblin Paladin, and my brother played as an Orc Samurai. Oh, nice. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, Goblins have their own kind of play style. Paladins have their own kind of play style. They describe them briefly in the mm-hmm. rulebook. Uh, but trying out different combinations and finding one that suits your play style is probably pretty essential to the game. That's cool. Cool. So I assume this is a small company that's brought it up? Um, it's published by Alderac, um, but I believe it was kind of like a small design company. I think it's uh, Fun to Eleven Games or okay. Entertainment. Okay. Um, and then they got published by Alderac during the Kickstarter. Cool. Go with them. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Yeah, so we have a few things to talk that I'd like to talk about in the Gaming Meta segment. 
Um, uh, and maybe part of this can be internet reactions and stuff, which is always fun. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, there's been some articles that I've been, I've actually been following the reaction more so than any of the articles. Uh, but uh, Kotaku has been, or at least editors on Kotaku have been complaining recently um, because apparently they've been, they're calling it a blacklist, but they've been, they say, blacklisted by both Bethesda and Ubisoft. Aww. Yeah, and I, I have no sympathy for them, but um, essentially what they, the reason for it is because they, they've been pretty hypercritical of games from both series. For example, I'm sure you're aware of this, Doc, since Ubisoft mm-hmm. publishes Assassin's Creed. Yeah. They've been um, quite malicious in some of the articles that they've, articles, that's, to use that term very loosely, they're basically just op-eds. Um, if where get, either the game's perfect or it's horrible, either well, way they get clicks. Is it Syndicate? Is that what they've been making fun of? Well, they've been making fun of various. I know there. I think it was Syndicate. It was one of them where they basically went on this long rant about how um, there needs to be a female protagonist in Assassin's Creed. And there it was is basically, one. I know. And uh, Kotaku is also the one that uh, said the ending of MGS Five was terrible for all these reasons, and therefore it's a well. They said the game was good, but they. Uh, thought the the story was awful and unfinished and all this. But other aren't stuff. they the shock jocks? I mean, isn't they are the, they are they're basically tab they're tabloid journalism. Yeah. So the thing is, they're co shockers. Essentially, essentially, what and that's all. It's all of Gawker. It's it's because they're owned by Gawker Media. Yeah. Um. These they're basically um they're like the uh yeah the shock jocks of of the internet. I I just I don't think they have any integrity. So I think it's hilarious. And speaking of the blacklist, to go into a little more detail on this, basically what happened was because of all these bad articles and also because they've been they've leaked content. Mm-hmm. For example, um, uh, Bioware has been also against, uh, doesn't want to deal with them anymore either, um, because they leaked the original, you know, the ending for Mass Effect 3, which caused them to have to go back and change it. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've been very, actually very vocal about their dislike of Kotaku. And when you say leak, it's like they get an advanced copy for review, yes. but then they leak details before the game's actually Yes, out. which is why they don't get these advanced copies anymore. And mm-hmm. it's just, this is basically Bethesda and Ubisoft for about a year now. Refuse to give them advanced copies, press copies to review. They just right. they don't give them to them anymore. And uh, yeah, they're they're complaining about it, but there's a very good reason why they're not getting those copies. And they don't have any right to these copies. There's no mm-hmm. there's no special right that they get yeah. mm-hmm. to have these. So freedom of the press, man. It's in the yeah, constitution. It's, it's, and it's not like they're saying they can't review their games anymore. They can go buy the game correct. after it comes out, play correct. it, re- give it a solo horrible review. It's not like the company right. can censor them. They don't get any sort of. They don't deserve. Special treatment. Yeah. If they want to get it, if they want to get it, they're going to have to work with the company. If the company doesn't like the sort of articles that they're writing about them, then why should they care? And the funniest part is that that in all these complaints that Kotaku has, they're they're acting as though, oh, this is so bad for ga- for gaming and games <laughs> journal. And the gamers are going to back us up. You go and you go online and you see just nonstop people going, oh, this is great, screw them. <laughs> it's like, and no one's on their side. It's uh-huh. hilarious. Um, so I, I, I find what you're saying, I guess. Quite, yeah, I find the whole thing quite funny. With the black, even with the blacklist, I follow various, um, you know, I don't know if I want to call them gaming celebrities, but people like, um, you know, uh, like Total Biscuit, uh, Notch, and uh, uh, like you know, Boogie. There's various notable guys that figures. are notable figures. Not Notch wizard. being a, a yeah. developer, but anyway. <laughs> so like, I know for for example, um, uh, you know, Boogie was he he tweeted something where it's like he's been blacklisted by Kotaku for like quite a while now just because they didn't like something that he said he's been blacklisted and he's just he hasn't done anything but they blacklisted him so he's like oh this is so ironic that now they're complaining about being blacklisted (laughs) and then uh, Notch responded to him and then I actually thought it was cool he said he showed a a a picture of uh, basically a list he calls it his bucket list and has some funny things on it like Make a million dollars. He scratched it off and put billion next to it and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean, he's he's a pretty funny guy. And so uh, one of his things on the bucket list was get blacklisted by Kotaku. <laughs> but yeah, so he tweets about yeah, I, w- I want to get blacklisted by some. These they're not respected by anyone is kind of my point that yeah. I'm getting at here. Um, so no one's really giving them a whole lot of like um, sympathy. They're not really getting the sympathy that they thought they were going to get. So uh, I, I found the whole thing pretty funny. Um, and then moving moving along here, we recently had the uh, Nintendo Direct, Ooh. which a lot of news came out from that. First time back since um, Satoru Iwata passed away, so yes, it was kind yes. of uh, significant that they were back to their old ways again. Yes, I believe it was on November twelfth, if I remember correctly. Um, and one of the there's a, there's a couple things we, I want to talk about here. Uh, one of them is the introduction of Linkle, and it's not it's a it's a character. I know the name sounds very silly. It is silly. I don't like the name. Um, but essentially, this character actually has been around. If you fi- you can find some um, 
designs of her in Japan, some Japanese magazines before her introduction, official introduction into a video game. In this case, Hyrule, Warrior, Hyrule Warriors. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it's so hard for me to say. Um, but uh, Linkle is basically um, this character that was conceived as a girl in, from Link's village that dresses somewhat similarly, mm-hmm. Similarly, you could say, wears the, the green outfit, has kind of like a hood. I think in the direct they actually introduced her as like Link's biggest fan or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and it's, they kind of go into that one. I know in the in the original uh, description it was just she was a girl in Link's village, that kind of thing. She yeah. has two crossbows that she mm-hmm. uses. But right after the introduction, people, I guess, who just saw a picture and, ne- and heard the name, which, by the way, again, the name is ridiculous. I like the character design, by the way, but mm-hmm. the name is ridiculous. Um, but people saw it, and there were a whole bunch of, of uh, you know, Twitter overreactions, mm-hmm. which tends to be all, all Twitter is, yeah. of, of, of a <laughs> ton of people just going, like, oh, Link's a girl now. Ha, yeah. look at this. Nintendo listened. We, now Link's a girl, guys. <laughs> Progressivism. It's, yeah, it's like, but video it, games are advancing. It's beyond absurd. Massager. It's not, yeah, it's not Link. It's a different character entirely. Which, by the way, if they did suddenly change Link into a girl, wouldn't that be a bad thing, too? Because then it's basically you're just taking a male character and now... It's the same character, but now it's just a female. Like, how does that? How is that really an improvement? Like, there have been a dozen links, and they're not all the same characters. So. Yeah, already. So like, I, I could see, but, like, you know, if in a new main main Zelda title they made like a girl this time, it's like, okay, cool with that. I would yeah. definitely not be cool with that. We've had that discussion for a long time. Yeah, and um, it's and for mainly the record, because mainly because it's not the legend. This it mm-hmm. goes against the whole legend. But regardless, the for, point for the that, record, we're very up for we're very for inclusivity in games. Uh, we're just not liking. Overreacting people to well, right? No, people no, no. Overreacting I, to everything. I, I like the Linkle character. Mm-hmm. I actually think it's. I actually think she's a pretty cool character. I like yeah. the design. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm just saying that I found it hilarious that people that didn't even pay attention to the yeah. direct <laughs> were going on and on about how this is some great victory because now Link's a girl. Yeah. When it's, it's not even. It's a different character. Like guys. The people who are upset that there's a black guy in the new Star Wars. Yeah, which is stupid. There's only been yeah. two in the whole universe, yeah. <laughs> and if he ends up being uh, like Lando's son, then that's still only one family. But. Which I don't think is the case. Not me but. either. <laughs> but there, it's, it's like get over is, yourself. This is an yeah. aside, but there was a bunch of people talking about like how he got the um, the lightsaber that because it seems like he has the lightsaber that you know Luke was using yeah, yeah. from Empire. And uh, the, the the running joke that I've been hearing on the internet is that um, he was working as a janitor on at Cloud City, and he found it like in one of the oh. years. Yeah, it's a really bad joke. Really bad joke. I like it. Um, but yeah, that was that's the that's the running. Jo- Obviously, no one's really serious yeah. when they say that. But um, but anyway, getting back to uh, the Nintendo Direct, there was other news coming out of the Nintendo Direct. Um, one of which is uh, Cloud was introduced into the new Smash Brothers, which, by the way. Um, the Smash Brothers for the Wii U, um, like Final Fantasy and 3DS, yes, yeah. Final Fantasy VII Cloud. But uh, the the roster for that game is just exploded. I mean, it's huge. It's 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 quite varied. Um, I don't know. My reaction to it, I have to say, and we talked about it a bit before we started recording. Um, I just, I didn't really. It kind of bothered me a bit, and I'm not really sure why because it's just a character in a game. But I, I think part of the reason might be the fact that it, this character was very clearly included. Based on fan request. He's been a requested character for a very long time, and the reason nobody ever thought he actually would be on the Smash Bros. roster is that generally on the Smash Bros. roster, it's either from a company that's affiliated with Nintendo. For example, Namco helped make this game, so obviously Namco characters can be on there. Capcom lent Mega Man, and then it it sort of followed that they lent um, uh, Ryu. But those have also been on Nintendo platforms. That's why Mega Man was on there, because he got his start on Nintendo. Mm -hmm. What about Kingdom Hearts? Uh, Kingdom Hearts. I guess technically, Cloud has appeared on a Nintendo platform. Now they mention it, yeah. so there you uh, go. Don't, don't get me started about how much I can't stand uh, Kingdom Hearts. But, that's a whole other discussion. But, but without distracting too much, though, like you know, <laughs> Final Fantasy VII was never on Nintendo. It doesn't look like it's ever going to be on Nintendo. Well, and, and, and actually, I think he was in Theater Rhythm, which, which was on the 3DS. So like, there's a Final Fantasy yeah, like, Rhythm music yeah. game. Um, I also, the, I guess, part of it for me is that there's so many. Final Fantasy characters that actually have appeared on Nintendo platforms mm-hmm. that they went with one that didn't. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's part of it. Maybe he, it's, he's kind of like the the quote unquote easy choice of the character that everyone recognizes from Final Fantasy. Um, you could get, you could have taken another Final Fantasy character and not everyone ne- would have necessarily recognized it. I don't know. I think the most recognizable would actually be um, just do like Black Mage. Yeah, I think Black Mage would work. Black but... Mage, or they could technically do. Um, was it Vivi from Final Fantasy IX who was basically just designed to be Black Mage? Yeah. If they wanted to be a specific Black Mage. But I think the Black Mage character, just the design of that, is actually quite iconic for the mm-hmm. series. I don't know. I think the whole thing's kind of uh, a little platformist. Think about Wreck-It Ralph, the movie. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, did did you walk out of the film 
outraged because of some of the cameo characters from the, those two could never have been on the same platform. Mm. Ah! Well, there was once upon a time yeah. Sonic and Mario never could have coexisted, and now they've got Mario and Sonic at the Olympics. See? You know? Exactly. I, yeah. I, I will say, and I actually have wanted to see that movie, but I actually have not seen it. I well, admit. don't because clearly <laughs> you are a platformist. No, I think part of it. No, That's I think. A new word. Mm. Uh, sure, I'm a platformist. I, I'm an unabashed platformist. I have to work on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just, I, it, it does art me. I, I will admit, and I think it's a silly thing to be concerned by because it really, ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. For I, I kind of like the announcement. I think there are other um, characters I would have been more excited about, but at the same time, I am excited to try it out. I yeah. think it's gonna be cool. Well, there's so many cool characters in there anyway, and they mm-hmm. really have sort of mined a lot of the, mm-hmm. the character of their past. Yeah. I mean. and a lot of ways too. This with this inclusion, it kind of now has demonstrated that it is kind of the ultimate Smash Brothers. It has a very broad range of characters from a whole bunch of different companies. It's kind of like pretty much a lot of people's dream roster has been collected into this game. So even if like you and I aren't excited about it, like a ton of people are just like super psyched that it's the Smash Bros with, uh, you know, it's got for you, it's got Mega Man, it's got Sonic, it's got Cloud, it's got like, you know, all these different characters representing all these different companies all on this game that they've really loved for all these years. So it's got Pac-Man. Yeah. It's got Pac-Man. Let's not forget Pac-Man. Yeah. Pac-Man. For Whatever sure. you do, don't play Poker Night at the inventory. <laughs> uh, it's actually a fun game. It's, that's it's, a great one. Yeah, no, it's not the mashup that the mashups because that's actually what what Smash Bros. roster has become. I think it was really just the issue of of it them picking a Final Fantasy representative and it being Cloud. But anyway, speaking of to moving on, speaking of the direct and some of the news coming out, one of the reasons why they introduced Cloud was because of the new Final Fantasy game coming out to the 3DS. Final Fantasy Explorers, I believe it's called. Oh, right, yeah. Um, what did, you, did you see the, the presentation for that mm-hmm. game? What, I did. What did you think of it? It reminded me a little bit in concept of um, Crystal Chronicles on the GameCube. Yeah, I agree. Um, where it's kind of like it's it's playable as a single player, but it's really meant to be a multiplayer sort of yeah. experience. It's like, what, like a four-player co-op, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like it's kind of Final Fantasy cashing in on the Monster Hunter craze. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of taking doing their own take on that. And I think it looks yeah. pretty cool. I do too. Yeah. I actually and and they have of course all the classes, the character mm-hmm. classes that have been around really since um, Final Fantasy three, mm-hmm. uh, the Almanac, the, the, the original Japanese one, yeah, yeah, which were expanded on Final Fantasy five, and then from there they just built on them like Final Fantasy Tactics being a big one that really sort of mm-hmm. tried to go with that with that whole uh, class concept, which I love because you can kind of like build your own class. Like, you find the ability you really like from this class and add it to the class that you really like to play primarily. So it's kind of like, if I could have my ultimate sort of character, it would be this class, yeah. but with these skills. Yeah, like getting the extra skills as you go through. Right, right. right. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm actually kind of excited for it, uh, Final Fantasy Explorers. It's, I've been excited for a Final Fantasy game in a while, so it's <laughs> interesting. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you, were, if you heard any of the, the announcement. Did you watch any of the Nintendo Direct doc? No. No. Um, there's some other things. Let's see what else. Uh, there was also the new Star Fox game. I believe it's called yeah. Star Fox Zero, I want to say. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and that one also looks pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like it's kind of harkening back to the old school Star Fox. Mm-hmm. Um, also, apparently, first party, whereas the last major Star Fox release was third party. Um, so, you know, it looks like they're kind of like taking control again of it. And while I think a lot of people are probably going to protest that, like, well, they had ground combat in the last Star Fox and it was terrible, but I think. The fact that, one, it's not on foot. It's like, you know, it turns into the walker and you can fight that way. Right. I think the transformation is going to be popular again now that Nintendo is handling it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm interested to see what it turns out. Um, one of the things that kind of confused me in the presentation was the whole, like, dual screen, like, you can fly and aim at the same time thing. Yeah. In, in concept, I get it, but I'm curious to see how it actually controls. Because I'm sure it'll be intuitive once you play it, but just them explaining it. I'm like, wait, how does this work? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I'm interested to see that. I'm also very intrigued by, um, they announced a few more details about the new Fire Emblem, um, Fates. Yeah, Fates. Um, which, of course, we've known for a little while now that rather than having it be that you make your decision at the beginning of the game, basically play through the whole game, and then just make a different decision at the beginning and play through the whole thing again, um, now those are just two separate games. Um, and then, of course, you can now buy a bundle that includes both games. Um, and I think, did they say that save data transfers over between the two? Between the two games? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's going to be a part three also that's going to be DLC, and I think you get that DLC when you buy that sort of collector's edition bum- bundle. Um, so that's probably how I'm going to do it, because in that case you get essentially three games for the price of two, um, rather than buying all three separately. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty interested in it. To, um, I've been following Fire Emblem Fates for a while, so I, I'm kind of interested to see how it turns out. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, they have a couple more. I'm looking at their list here of, of, of games. Um 
there's a Pokken tournament, which is basically a Pokemon yeah. tournament game, which I know people have been mm-hmm. into looking for for a while. Well, it's, it's about. Tekken with Pokemon. Yes. Which is you really... Know, like, yeah, yeah, fine like, game. Yeah. I, I, I was really excited to see it, but I never thought it would actually get made, right. which is awesome. Um, they have another Mar- a Mario Tennis game, which um, those are those are pretty popular, usually pretty fun. Yeah. Um, they have a Mario and Luigi Paper Jam. Mm-hmm. And I'm a pretty big fan of the Mario and Luigi series mm-hmm. of RPGs. I think they're actually really cool. I love a lot of the little mm-hmm. um, humor that they kind of weave into it. Yeah. I know that like your mustache is part of a mm-hmm. part of your stats. Things yeah. like that are just kind of which, fun. Which is awesome. I right. Love that stash is a, uh, a stat. Yes. <laughs> um, and then and um, also uh, Xenoblade Chronicles. Chronicles X, so I wanted to mention a little bit. It is an open world mm-hmm. game in its own right, and it's I, I played the first uh, Xenoblade mm-hmm. on um, the Wii, which mm-hmm. I actually enjoyed a lot more than I expected to. Mm-hmm. This one's really pushing for that, pushing for that open world um, mm-hmm. concept. Um, very big cities, very big environments. Um, are you interested in, pl- in playing? Yeah, or? yeah. In fact, I still need to go back and play um, Xenoblade Chronicles for the Wii. Uh-huh. Um, I rinsed it very briefly, and it just wasn't speaking to me at the time, mm-hmm. and so I sent it back pretty quick and never finished it. But um, it does sound like it's a cool game, and I'm actually really interested to see um, Chronicles X. It so. reminds me a lot of um, TSO, Fantasy Star Online, mm-hmm. and then it also kind of has this almost like an MMO offline a little bit feel to it. Mm-hmm. So there is that element. Um, I do think there's a little more... Um, mo- a little more there in terms of depth, but in terms of the combat system, it does remind me a lot of, of mm-hmm. that. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So recently Hearthstone came out with another new content uh, pack. Um, it is the League of Explorers. It's another adventure, and I really enjoy the single-player adventures. Um, and what's interesting is they came out with another expansion not too long ago, which was, of course, um, the Grand Tournament, which is, of course, whenever you add new um, cards, and especially in this case you're adding like 150 new cards, it's going to shift the meta a little bit. Oh, yeah. But I haven't seen too big a shift in the meta since that one came out. Like, things are kind of operating more or less the same way. There are like a few new cards, people working into old strategies. But it doesn't seem to have like had the giant shift that um, uh, goblins and gnomes had. Yeah, they only fixed one card to my knowledge. Oh, they changed one card. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I mean. Um, yeah, which I was super happy about. The Warsong Commander. Yeah. Um, no more Grim Warrior. Uh-huh. Oh, God, that drives me so nuts. But I love the Inspire mechanic. I think mm-hmm. it's a lot of fun. It, it is cool. And there are some really cool cards that have come out of that and some interesting new decks. Like, the meta did shift. Like, Paladins are a lot more powerful now. Like, mm-hmm. Aggro Paladin is kind of a more viable option. Um, but one of the things that I'm interested to see what happens with uh, League of Explorers, which at the time of recording, only two of the four weeks have been released so far. Yeah. But even then, there are some new cards that are getting introduced and more will get introduced with time. I actually think this has a good chance to shift the meta more than the last one did because in the last one, you're kind of counting on people getting cards through packs or yeah. you know, buying the cards. With this one, anyone who buys it and clears it, everyone has access to all those legendaries guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And so when everyone has the same legendaries... Um, very specific strategies and that's happened emerging. two times before and, yeah. and that did certainly shift with the next yeah, with really did. Um, uh, Molten Core well, what's the new mechanic that's um, been introduced in this one is it the draw mechanic uh, it's called Discovery Discovery yeah right. um, and actually just in general it seems like this one is all about sort of um, adding more cards to your deck over mm-hmm. time so you draw a card that says discover something um, and you get to pick from you know, like one of three things um, or there might be a card that has like discover as like a battle cry or something like that. So you put down a card, but then you also get to draw one of three random cards. That's right. But there's also, for example, a mage card um, called I think uh, Forgotten Torch or something like that, mm-hmm. which it's like a three damage fire spell, but then it adds a six damage fire spell to your deck. So when you play it, it's actually also refilling your deck a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it's also, um, like, there have been some uh, deck types that have sort of played around with cards and drawing cards, because, of course, when you get out of cards, each time you have to draw, it does fatigue damage. And yep. every time you draw, it does one more fatigue damage. So the first time it's one, the second time it's two, and so on. Great against a warlock. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, like, for example, there's a, an archetype called the Mill Rogue, which um, is all about basically surviving long enough to force your opponent to keep drawing cards so that it's just the card draw damage that's mm-hmm. killing them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So the idea now that you can sort of replenish your deck as you go along is going to, I think, shift that particular meta. Not that it was super popular, but the decks that kind of rely on either drawing through your deck very quickly, um, like Warlock is actually helped by this mm-hmm. because... 
they get to have more cards that they can draw. Yeah. Um, you know, like I play, I've been playing a free freeze mage recently and, um, I'm actually trying to draw as quickly as possible. So I have access to all my tools, Yeah. but now I could also potentially have a few more extra cards. So I don't have to worry about fatigue quite as much. So yeah, my, my main concern is that some of those games can go on for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed lately that the games have tended to be a little bit longer, mm-hmm. one to two minutes longer than they used to. Mm-hmm. Um, so this new mechanic, I'm wondering if that's going to affect that. It might. Um, and in a way, like, you know, I'm sure they've been planning this for a long time, um, but in a way it kind of seems like it's timely in the sense that, um, with this new expansion, Rush seems to be the emphasized shift in the meta. Right. There's like more, you're doing like bigger damage, more burst, you know, trying to Mm -hmm. like deal damage more quickly. Um, and so in the sense that like, if the game was sped up by this, this is also going to slow it down a little bit. Yay. The Murlocs will reign supreme. (laughs) Cool. So. Yeah, I'm not. I just, it seems like Burlock's got a little bit of a boost, actually, they did. in mm. League of Explorers. Yeah, they so, sure did. Which I'm cool with. I like Murlocs. Yeah. I hate playing against them, but yeah, yeah, they're fun. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. Um, okay, so I did want to talk a little bit about um, Into the Badlands, which is a new series on AMC uh, that recently came out last Sunday. And actually, uh, apparently, it hit the third highest. Uh, Debut numbers of a cable TV television series, which I thought was interesting. Really? Yeah, um, it's had a lot of hype behind it. Um, it's right up my alley because it's basically a post-apocalyptic martial arts series. Oh, nice! Or uh, specifically, it, it it blends a bunch of genres. Um, but I don't know if I'd call it post-apocalyptic. Um, this is something I actually wanted to talk about later on. I mean, we can stick a pin in that related to Fallout too. But it's this concept of a post-post apocalypse hmm. in the sense that um, as opposed to you know, the apocalypse happens, now everything's, you know, in he- te- gone to hell, yeah. and there's civilizations in ruins, versus the post-post-apocalypse, which would be after the apocalypse, okay, now civilization is kind of getting back together well, and resistance. trying to pick itself back up, right. Yeah. And and one of the things with Fallout that I think is actually telling as a difference between um, the original, you know, Fallouts and the new one is it's almost like, especially, you know, you can see it with the Bioware versus, um, versus um, I'm sorry, Obsidian, Black Island Obsidian, and then the Bethesda difference. It's like Bethesda sees Fallout as post-apocalypse, whereas you know Obsidian and Black Isle saw it more as a post-post-apocalypse. You see a lot more. There's already these divisions and and, and return of society. That right. kind of thing. Less society of society like, looks different. But l- less of a like mm-hmm. everything's to hell right now. Yeah, but war never changes. Right. <laughs> I do want to read this. This is from the intro of the series uh, to give you a little. A uh, little intro that, the, that it does at the very beginning, the opening uh, part of it. it says the wars were so long ago, nobody even remembers. Darkness and fear ruled until the time of the barons. Seven men and women who forged order out of chaos. People flocked to them for protection. That protection became servitude. They banished guns and trained armies of lethal fighters they called clippers. This world is built on blood. Nobody is innocent here. Welcome to the Badlands. Hmm. So it's kind of an interesting intro. It, it very much, it, it's a series that knows what it is, and it knows what people are watching it for. So it, it gives you that very early on. It gives you some really cool and actually well-choreographed fight scenes. Um, Sounds like the back page of an RPG, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it really does. It kind of has almost like, like I mean, almost like a video game type premise mm-hmm. where okay you're just in this really interesting post-apocalyptic world and oh you're you're this cool badass fighter and you're doing like martial art moves and stuff and uh, but as essentially essentially what the story follows is this guy named Sonny who is one of these clippers that works for these barons who of course you know at a certain point is going to break away from the baron because he's going to have to be the lone wanderer badass mm-hmm. obviously that's what everyone wants to see mm-hmm. but you know he has 404 kills and they, they they show this part where he takes off his jacket and he's got all these tattoos on his back for all the people that he has killed because that's what you're supposed to do essentially but he has to kill for his baron because he's been trained since he was a kid to do this um and of course there's there's the whole he he, very much so the um hero's journey type concept where he gets the call and he kind of refuses initially Mm -hmm. to go off and explore this but oh but wait a minute he's gonna get thrust into it anyway because he goes and he helps this this you know boy character, and now some one of the, the you know Aaron's wives saw him do it, so now he's going to pretty much be forced to go off and leave, you know, and answer the call, that kind of thing. So it's it's very much an interesting series. Um, I've only seen one the first episode because that's all that's come out so far, um, and I believe this this uh, this season is really only going to be six episodes, from what I understand. So it's 
almost like its own sort of like little mini series kind of thing. That's but, what they did with Fear the Walking Dead. Yeah, but I, I found it so far very, very interesting. It grabbed me right away, and part of that I'm sure is because I'm a big fan of martial arts. Um, excuse me. The creators, uh, you might recognize them. Um, Alfred Go, Go, I'm sorry, Alfred Go and Miles Miller. Um, they're known for several different things throughout. Um, you know, I have kind of a long filmography, but they always seem to work together. But um, one of the things that stuck out for me was that they worked on Shanghai Noon um, and then its sequel, Shanghai Nights, which was um, Jackie Chan and yeah. Owen Wilson, um, a film that I actually liked quite a bit, especially the original Shanghai Noon. Shanghai Nights, not as much, but I still enjoyed it. Um, I'm a big Jackie Chan fan. So you can, I'm sure that they had plenty of connections when it comes to fight choreography, and it shines through in the series. They have a couple of... Um, Really just two, but they have a couple of really good fight sequences, one at the, near the very beginning and one at near the very end, um, which really kind of show off what you're going you're gonna to be in for in the series. Um, I will say one of the more interesting aspects of it is that it takes place in America in what feels like it seems to take place in America and what seems to be somewhere in like the American South because the Baron has this... He's like this weird sort of like half Mennonite, half redneck. Hmm. He has like a like a thick accent from somewhere and I'm not exactly sure I think it's like an indeterminate area in the south almost like it's from <laughs> Kentucky or something but it's just hilarious the way that they sort of have these weird mashups like oh there's no guns and there's people that are kind of you know having to you know fend for themselves with with other sort of weapons but for example Sonny drives around on a motorcycle and they have cars you know there's this weird disconnect and they oh and their cities look like they're from uh you know 1930s 1940s kind of aesthetic to them hmm. Like, that kind of aesthetic in the city is like, you know, Chicago from the 1940s or something. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you're also in, like, a far future. So it's got this, a lot of weird kind of mixes. The setting really kind of intrigues me. I mean, mm -hmm. and so um, it's, I think it's definitely a series. I mean, it's a series I'm going to be looking out for. So mm -hmm. it's something I'd recommend checking out if you're into uh, post-apocalypse, if you're into martial arts, or really if you're just a fan of what AMC is doing when it comes to um, dramatic television, which is pretty much knocking it out of the park every time. So I think it's pretty much anything AMC puts out, I'll at least give a chance to. So we're nearing the uh, the end of our topics feast here. Um, you know, it's, it's always kind of sad when the holiday starts to wind down to a close. But do you guys have any other uh, closing thoughts before we uh, move on to dessert? Well, I will say I did drown my, uh, my segments in plenty of gravy, because that's how I like to roll. So <laughs> Salty it, gravy? It helped them go down, yeah. It was, made them more palatable. <laughs> I'm just glad we're finally done. I can get back to fall out for it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 52 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast, our Thanksgiving special. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, bring your own side dish to the feast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.